good afternoon. How is everybody? Yeah. Excited? Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Mary Grove, and I'm the director of Google for Entrepreneurs. It is my tremendous honor to welcome Diane von Furstenberg back to Google. Our guest today is a remarkable talent who needs no introduction, but I would like to share three things that particularly I admire about Diane. The first is that she is the ultimate entrepreneur, an incredible self-starter whose story really embodies the quintessential American dream. From Diane's arrival in New York City in 1970 with just one suitcase full of dresses, DVF products are now sold in 55 countries around the world and has evolved far beyond the iconic wrap dress, which we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of this year. Number two is Diane's steadfast commitment to empowering women all over the world. And in 2011, she established, through the Diller von Furstenberg Family Foundation, the DVF Awards. And these awards recognize women who show tremendous courage and bravery in the face of adversity. And I admire all that she does to support women. And thirdly, I admire her generosity and openness in sharing so personally her own story, her own amazing family history, her journey in establishing and building a global brand that is loved around the world, her personal battle with cancer, which she fought courageously and successfully, and her views on love and life. Please join me in welcoming Diane von Furstenberg. Hi. Welcome. Hi. It's wonderful to have you back. Thank you. When I, I came here to speak in 2005, I think, there were practically no women here. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure the, the others knew who I was. And that's definitely changed. And, but it was, uh, and it was, it was pretty amazing already, but it was nothing compared to what it is now. So it's fun to be here. So welcome back. Before we get started, I want to cue just a quick video, which is the journey of the wrap dress. started by talking about your roots, and you shared so much of your personal journey. You opened your book by talking about your mother's courageous story as a Holocaust survivor, how she gave birth to you against all odds, and she said to you, you are my torch of freedom and taught you that fear is not an option. Can you share with us a memory of how your mother helped you become the woman you wanted to be? Well, first of all, I think my mother was a, what they call today a tiger mom. <laughs> And which is that if I was afraid of the dark, she would lock me into the closet, and which today you could probably be arrested for. <laughs> and, uh, but of course, after 10 minutes, the, the, it wasn't dark anymore, because when you're in the dark for 10 minutes, you can see. And also, you realize that there's no reason to be afraid. So my mother didn't want me to be afraid. And one of the reasons why she didn't want me to be afraid is because of her own history. At the age of 22, she was a prisoner of war, and she went to the Nazi can concentration camp of Auschwitz and uh, Ravensbrück, and the third one. She came back. She weighed 49 pounds, uh, I mean, less than her bones. She wasn't supposed to have survived, but she did. She went back home, and her mother fed her. Six months later, her fiancé came back to Belgium. He had been in Switzerland. And they got married, and the doctor said, you absolutely cannot have a child, because if you have a child, um, you, I mean, you, your body can handle it. And besides, the, the child will probably be not normal. 
Well, sure enough, I was born nine months later. An extraordinary child. And I was not normal. Uh, so, I, and you know, when, well, you're all young, so you know that. You know, when your mother is very strong, you kind of protect yourself from, from all that strength. But then when your mother passed away, you, you think a little bit more, the, you know, the impact that she had on me. And so I wanted to tell her story. And by telling, by doing research and do it, telling her story, I realized that I am her vengeance, and I, and I am the way I am because of that, because of what she was. So, so I ended up writing about my mother and then ended up writing about me. And so this book, this memoir, has been really difficult. I've never gone through therapy before, and I did, I did that. Um, but I really opened myself. And, uh, and I tell it really as it is, because I think that truth and honesty is certainly the most useful thing you could do for yourself, but it's also good to, to do it, you know, to have others do it. So I am glad that people are responding well to the book, because otherwise I would feel terrible, I would feel horrible that I opened myself for nothing. So... I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for doing that. Absolutely. So in the business of fashion, the wrap dress, which launched in 1974, by 1978 had sold millions already throughout the, the nation. And it was revolutionary in its, its softness, its versatility. What do you think the wrap dress symbolized then? And what does it symbolize now, 40 years later? Well, the first thing it symbolized is that I could pay my bills. <laughs> and, which was, at the end, what I, you know, my goal then was, my first goal was to be independent because my mother put it in my head and I really wanted to be independent. So I became independent to that dress. But what, because it was fashion, what, what now I realize, of course I didn't realize it then, but now looking back I realize is that as I was becoming independent, and confident and the woman I wanted to be, I was sharing it to other women in fitting rooms and make, and so I was getting confident and I was selling confidence through the dress. So that dress, I mean, to me, I just made that dress. It's not like I thought it was something that will live for that long. But I guess that in a sense, it was my need, my own personal need for freedom, and, and um, so the dress was good quality, it was effortless, it was sexy, it was not too expensive, but it just molded you. It was proper enough and sexy enough. And somehow, I guess that that message, you know, um, that was done through a dress really took on, and, and, and women really reacted to it. And everyone in America wore that dress. I mean, I was uh, 25, and you know, within within no time at all, we were making 25,000 dresses a week, which is 50,000 sleeves. That's a lot. <laughs> I remember I used to say that because it looked more. <laughs> so I lived an American dream, which, of course, my American dream is nothing compared to you know a Google, and I mean, it was very minute. But it was nevertheless an American dream, and I was a young woman, and um, like that. So speaking of Google, and, and welcome back to Silicon Valley, you've always been so transformative and, and disrupting the fashion industry. If you look back across the last four decades, you started selling your dresses on QVC and the Home Shopping Network before merchandise clothing was really sold on television. Last year you worked with Sergey to debut Google Glass at a DVF fashion show, as well as launched the first shoppable hangout where consumers could purchase products live through a Google Plus hangout. So looking now, what technologies are you most excited about or do you think are most critical to the success of your business? Well, first of all, I, I, I joke always and I say that I'm so happy that uh, I am old enough to have danced at Studio 54 and young enough to be part of the 
digital revolution. I saw you Instagram outside before we came in. I so. did. And, 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 um, and so I love technology, and I think it's so incredible what has happened, and all the grounds that were broken, and all the things that you can do that we, there was no way that we could dream that we could do. So I am very, very into it, and I love it. And, uh, and it, it, again, it's, it was an accident that I presented the Google Glass first in the world. I mean, you know, it was, again, but it just shows you that when you are young, or, or not young, it's important to push the doors, whatever is happening. And it's just because I saw Sergey hiding behind a tree, trying this thing, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, come, I show you. And he hadn't shown anyone. This was in Sun Valley. And, and he showed me that. And we started to talk. And it was July. And I said, Sergey, have you ever been to a fashion show? He said, no, never. I said, you should come to my show in, in, um, in September. That was it. And then two or three weeks later, I get a call from Sergey. And he said, mm, you know, I was thinking, how about showing Google Glass on the runway. And I thought, oh, I didn't even understand what he was talking about. I said, sure. <laughs> and, and, um, and what it was, he must have been that day with talking marketing and say, how can we show it to the world in a way that is not just dry tech? And somebody said some, the word fashion. He said, oh, fashion. I have a friend in fashion. She invited me to a fashion show. And, and, and that is actually how the whole thing happened. And um, when you read the book, it's at the very end of the whole story, is at the very end of the book. You'll see that I, that day I wasn't particularly loving the, my, my show. And so, anyway, Google Glass kind of saved my show because, anyway, so it's a long story. But <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it just shows you that you always have to be very wide open and curious and open to anything. So on that note, and following your journey, I noticed that you have a unique eye for recognizing an opportunity and then seizing the moment. So one example would be, in your book, you talked about how you, you had trained in Italy and you noticed this trend in Europe where t-shirts, fashion t-shirts, were just becoming fashionable in the jersey material, the soft material. And so you brought some of that to America and then evolved into the wrap dress. Another example would be relaunching your business when you noticed that that the hip young girls were wearing vintage DVF dresses from the 70s and relaunching the, the wrap dress. So I'm curious if you see any big new opportunities today, if you think you know, fashion startups can really do anything to, to seize a gap. Oh, my God, you don't need any, you don't need me to tell you that. I mean, there's so many intelligent people here who are looking for opportunities and pushing the ground. Um, I mean, if anything, I'm here to learn from you. Um, but it is, you know, I think it is important to, to dare and uh, to dare and push and look and be curious. And, and also, you know, when you fail, you fail and you get back up and do it again. It's, um, you know, life is a journey and it's a big journey and people come in, people go out, you have successes, you have failures. And as long as you're true to yourself, it's okay. So we want to talk about the brand, the global brand that has become a phenomenon. And you arrived in New York and launched with the dress, but ended up you know, transforming and growing the line into cosmetics, into fragrances, a home line, and so much more. Can you talk about the lessons you learned along the way about developing DVF as a brand? Oh my god, I, I, I learned so many lessons, but I am not necessarily a good example of business. I am an entrepreneur. I am a dreamer. And I'm a person who can make, who can have an idea and make it happen. I'm not the best executive. I can, I'm not a CEO. So the lesson that I would say is that um, it's important to recognize your strength and and your weaknesses. And uh, but I mean that's you know in the in the book it's. Um, this book is like therapy. I never went to therapy before, and this book was therapy. And um, 
But it shows that it doesn't matter how old you are. I mean, I'm a grandmother. I'm old. I have a dra I have. I came up with something that's already 40. That you think that's so old. So I mean, and yet I still think of myself like I'm a young girl and I'm starting up. And I and I guess I'll always be like that. I mean, um, but I think in a sense that's also my energy and and who I am. So. That's why I start again and again and again. Love is life is love, That's I hear right. you say. So in the book, you talk about how you often speak with young people, and a favorite piece of advice you give them is it's passion and persistence that matter, and dreams are achievable, but there are no shortcuts and no hard work. What is the best? I want to flip that question and ask you, what's the best piece of career advice you received along the way, and how did that impact your journey? I don't know. I mean, I, the, only res, the only real advice that I got from my mother, which I remember the most, is that never be a victim and never blame anyone for anything, even if they are blamable. Just deal with it. And that was a great advice because resentment are toxic and blaming people don't count, doesn't help anything. So that was really, I mean, the independence, what my mother gave me was the independence, and that is really something that I value so much. Now, what I found out by myself, and really, really early on, and I'm astounded that I, I realized that early on, is, and that would be my advice to anyone, is that the most important relationship in life is the one you have with yourself. I mean, I, I, I don't think I can give a bigger advice, and an advice that applies to everyone, men, women, old, young, doesn't matter. Because at the end, the strength is in yourself, and, and it's not in somebody else. And it's not any guy that's going to make trans. It's not. It's you. Then if you have that relationship with yourself, figured out, and, and it's not like you figure it out and it's good forever. It's a practice, it's every day, da, da, da. You have to be angry with yourself and then you have to be nice to yourself and, you, have, you know, a lot of different things. And it's a practice. It's like pruning the trees or, or cleaning the plumbing. But once you do have that and once you really have a relationship with yourself, then any other relationship is a plus and not a must. And so you, you're not needy. And I think that's important. So that's my advice. Great, great. Remember. <laughs> the most important relationship is with yourself. That's right. So shifting gears a bit, I want to talk about the future and what you're focused on in the road ahead. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your new TV show? Oh. Yes, yeah, so this year was very, very busy. In January, I celebrated the 40th anniversary of the of the of the wrap dress in a big exhibition at LACMA in Los Angeles, which is now featured in this big coffee table book, It's Only the Journey of a Dress. Then I finished my memoir, which was very painful and very, very tiring. And, and then I also did something a little crazy. I did a TV show, and it's called The House of DVF, and it is... It, it, in a sense, it's, it's both to be in touch with young people and, and also because I see what my gra the garbage that my granddaughters watch on television. And so how can I go to that genre and apply to that and make it fun and make it naughty and make it informative, but at the same time manage to pass some strong, empowering messages. And so we came up with this idea of eight girls who come into the company and they learn everything from merchandising to retailing to uh, marketing and design, and then one of them will win and become a brand ambassador. So we have already have three episodes, which you could probably see online. It's on E! And Sunday night at 10 o'clock, you can watch episode four. <laughs> and uh, it's eight episodes, and it will end on uh, uh, December 20th, I think. And, um, and that's it. Great. So on that and note, one of the candidates is from the Bay Area. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you who wins. <laughs>
So in terms of looking ahead from a business perspective, in your book you talk about you know, DVF products are sold in over 55 countries. One of the more recent countries you entered was China. Mm. Can you talk about the, your entry into the Chinese market, how you okay, approached first, it? Yeah. First of all, I love China. I mean, I grew up reading books about China, Pearl Beck or Tintin or everything. I was always fascinated by the mystery and, and the strength and the wall of China, everything. And um, so the first time I went to China was 1989 or 1990, and they were only bicycles in, in, in Beijing at the time. And, um, but, uh, so I, I wanted to be known. I woke up about maybe now by now, it's maybe four years ago, and I said, I want to be known in China. And so I went to China a lot, and I, got, I became very friendly with a lot of people people, artists, and writers, and bloggers, and, and, uh, and I, 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 I spent a lot of time because I, I wanted to, because when I was a young girl, even though, it's funny, because even, even though I didn't think I was going to be in fashion, I, I remember that I used to say, if you sell one t-shirt to every Chinese, you may, you know. And so I already had that in my mind. So I really, but I wanted to come to China and not sound like a, an American colonizer. And so I, um, I spent time knowing the people and becoming friends with them. And little by little, I got known in, in China. And I have, I How have. How many stores now? Quite oh, I don't know. I have, a, I don't know. I have about 40 stores, I think. Oh, Quite a lot in China, and I have uh, I have how many one million or two million followers? I mean a lot, and uh, and anyway, and um, that's it. So I, I I I like Chinese people. I think they are smart, and they are, and and they you know they they're great. I mean, I, I totally identify, and I wish I spoke the language, but then again, I'm not Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> so in terms of community, you've been incredibly involved through philanthropy, through your, your own family foundation, more recently supported efforts like the High Line in the west side of Manhattan near the Google office, and a new park and art space that's called Pier 55. Mm -hmm. What is your hope for where New York City might be in five to 10 years? Well, let's, stay, let's hope that it stay out of the water, <laughs> for one thing. And, uh, you know, I always saw New York like Venice. For me, it's like Venice. It's the center of both commerce and art. Every artist in the world wants to show in New York and, and, buy, and be sold in New York. Uh, so I, for me, Venice and, and New York were very similar. So that's why I'm very involved into the waterways, and and I think that you know we had a tendency of going inland and building highways along the coast. So now we're trying to to change that. Uh, New, when I first came to New York, it was uh, very very cheap, but it was also very very dangerous probably goes together. And, but at the same time, there were a lot of, because it was very cheap, there were a lot of artists there, and it was, it was fun. It was really, really fun. Now it's different. It's much more expensive, and it's, it's different. But it still has a lot of energy. And I think that one of the reasons that New York has so much energy is because it's built on granite. You know, and so the minute you get to New York, <clears throat> you have a lot of energy. I'm sure Google is built on granite, too. <laughs> Whereas Paris is built on sand, so you have a tendency to kind of fall asleep. Do you spend much time back in Europe now, or are you between Europe and America? Uh, I am European, so I have a place in Paris, and so it's important for me to, to be, you know, it's nice for me to go to Europe. But my, my children and my grandchildren now live in the West Coast, so I have a tendency to go West. Are there any up-and-coming designers you think we should be on the lookout for? Well, I am the president of the Council of Fashion Designers of America, so I am basically the mother of all designers. <laughs> so as the mother of all designers, I can't have a favorite child. 
You heard it here first. So on that note, I am curious. You know, we talked a lot about how how your story personifies the American dream. You're an entrepreneur with this tremendous global perspective. And the way that businesses are born and grow has changed tremendously in the last 40 years. Even in fashion, you've seen the consolidation of the large uh, department stores, for example. Do you think that it would be easier or more difficult now to build a global business and brand? I don't think it's harder, actually. Uh, I think maybe it's, maybe it's easier, because you have the internet, so everyone has a voice. So if you have the internet, you just do a website that, that start. So And you have a voice. So I think that the internet you know, has given everyone more democrat, democracy. Mm -hmm. democracy. Absolutely. Um, even though sometimes it's a little dangerous. But um, I, so I think that overall, and the world is more global, and 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 so, and also you have more mentoring systems. And um, as a CFDA, we have a, an incredible program with Vogue. It's called the CFDA. CFDA Vogue Fashion Pro Fund, and uh, and we mentor um, young designers and help them, and and that has really helped enormously. So, I think that people are more into mentoring, but of course everything goes faster. Mm -hmm. In a few moments, I'm going to switch gears and take questions from the audience. So, if you have a question in mind, please feel free to go ahead and line up. So, Diane, I want to talk about your legacy, and you've talked about various phases of your life, how it was independence, you know, getting independence, how it was growing your business. Now it's sort of what legacy do you leave behind? You said that when you and, and Joel Horowitz were working on transforming the company in 2012, you did an exercise where everybody defined three words that exemplified the brand. Uh, those were effortless, sexy, and on the go. So if you could choose three words now to describe the legacy you hope DVF will leave behind. Well, what might they be? Well, I mean, I think that my mission in life overall, business and not, is really to empower women. Since I was, in, I empower myself first, and after I've empowered myself, it's important that I feel that every woman can be the woman they want to be. And so I do that through my work, by making them feel sexy and attractive with the clothes, but also through mentoring and, and through philanthropy. So maybe I hope to be remembered as, as a woman who, who did it for herself and for others. Wonderful. Thank you. <coughs> Let's take some questions from the audience. If you could introduce yourself to start, that'd be great. Hi, Diane. My name is Connor. I'm right be behind the camera. The only man here. <laughs> My husband is also here in the All right, all right. <laughs> Who's your it. husband? Steve Grove. The bearded one. Hi. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming out and, and talking with us. It's been wonderful to hear from you. My question is on your advice that you give about having, you know, your relationship with yourself is so important that you were astounded you found that out so early. How did you find that out, and what do people do on a day-to-day a -day basis to help build that relationship? How did I find out? I don't know. I mean, I, I was fascinated by mirrors when I was a tiny, tiny little girl. Not that I liked what I saw in the mirror, because I didn't, but I liked that I had control over that thing. You know, if I did that, she would do that. If she did that, then do that. So I think that it starts from there. My relationship, it starts with the mirror, I have to say. But it wasn't narcissism, because I didn't like what I looked like at all. But I liked that I had control. And so it made me realize that I have control over myself. That's awesome. I've always tried to explain my love of mirrors to other people, too. So <laughs> I can just point them right to that clip. That's fun. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. That's very brave of you. <laughs> Be brave. That's right. Um, so I have a question from when you first emerged in the fashion scene. What has been the biggest surprise to you in terms of what you've seen in the fashion world? What is the biggest surprise that I saw in the fashion world? I don't know. Oh my God, I don't know. I, I, I guess that there are not that many things that actually surprise me. I don't know. It can be a specific know. trend. What? What? It, can, it can be a specific trend. Oh, the big trend. trend. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but the big trend, they don't appear like all of a sudden, woo, it's a big trend. It kind of crawls on you. And if you are 
a designer, which at the end is what I am, you kind of smell it before it comes. And I, that can't be explained. That's really just what so the mystery of fashion. What? You can't be surprised, you know, everything. Else. No, I don't know everything <laughs> at all. And the more you know, the more you know, you know nothing. No, no, no. Uh, no, no. But I think it's, uh, I think it's, um, maybe what, I was, what surprised me the most is that fashion at the end is a huge industry, huge industry, but it's also a very mysterious very mysterious thing that expands not just on clothes but food and the way people do things. It's a little bit the collective kind of, you know, madness. Thank you. Hi, Diane. My name is Mayra Felix. And um, you talked about success and how you sometimes fail and sometimes succeed. So I was wondering if you can recall a time where you failed. Oh, I failed many times. <laughs> you got to read the book. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I failed many times. But what I will say to you is I never dwelled on my failures. I just said, okay, move on. Mm -hmm. This is the reality, whatever. Cut your losses or whatever, and then move on. And then as you move on, things happened good. And then you don't even realize that it all started with a failure. So that also was a lesson for my mother. She said not to dwell on the darkness, you know. So always look for the little bit of light and build around the light. Okay, and do you think, like, where do you find that strength? Because I feel like... Us as young people, sometimes it's like easy to get comfortable if you have like a job. Like, how can we find that strength to jump and not, you know, be you afraid? Know, the truth is that it's not the strength that you need in order to jump. You got to want it. And wanting it is most often starts from frustration. So... I mean, I don't know, I, I, I don't think I know any successful person whose success didn't start first with a huge frustration. Thank you. That is the truth. Hi, Diane. My Hi. name's Emily. Um, I have a question for you. Um, so at Google, you have we don't a have... dress. Oh, thank you. It's designed by you. <laughs> um, so we, we don't have a lot of women at Google, but... I imagine the fashion world is full of women, and there's lots of cattiness and like like mean people. Like, how how do you handle like really like catty people and like in your We're show? We're not you catty, are we? In a, in a <laughs> no, it's uh, how do you? I don't know. I I wouldn't waste any time on that. I I really wouldn't. At the end, you know, it's it's just. What matters is what matters, you know? I really enjoy your shows, and I love the message you gave. Oh, you mean about the show? Yeah. Oh, well, that's, you have to understand that the producer pushed them to, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the show. The show, they kind of say, oh, come on, are you upset? I mean, they, they can, and I get so mad when they do that because okay. I don't want that to be. But, uh, so it's to create a little drama, and I remember... My granddaughter telling me, Dee Dee, you need drama. You need drama. Thank you. <laughs> but you have zero tolerance for her. But I don't know. I don't like it. Yeah. Hello, my name is Firuze. I was wondering, uh, in your career, how much were you driven by the business side and how much were you driven by the artistic side? I was, my first drive was to be independent. So it was really to be successful financially, to buy my finance independence. Um, and so, and I didn't re even realize at the time how much the, the creative side mattered. I mean, I just used the creative side in order to achieve the next thing. Um, I would like to be able to spend more time now on the creative, you know, because I realize that I'm much better at that. Um, so, but unfortunately, you need you need both. But I personally prefer prefer the creative. But creative is not just designing a dress; it's thinking, you know, how you could sell it. It's also marketing. It's you know, it's a lot of that, and that I love. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Diane. I'm Hi. Lily. 
Um, so in the last few years, there's been so much of focus on, you know, can women have it all with being feminine and entrepreneurs and family life and business life, and you make it seem easy. No. Um, and I was just wondering what advice you have for, you know, people trying to strike that balance. No, it's, it's, it, it's not easy. I mean, it's not easy to, people always say, how did you have a career and children and a husband? And most probably the husband is the hardest. Um, and... Uh, and then I say, and it's so unfair that I say that because in my case it's not true. I have a husband who is absolutely not hard, but um, it's to combine it all is very very difficult. And but the truth is, I think that women are equipped. I think women were multitask before there was such a word, because we're used to handling it all and do it all and everything and. Uh, since we are mostly women, I always say, you know, just we have our period every month and, and nobody knows about it, right? <laughs> Men couldn't handle that. So, <laughs> I mean, I, so I think that we're just used to, it's hard. It's hard to do it all. It's hard to have it all. But it's worth it because I think a woman should have children whether she has them or adopts them or whatever. And I also think a woman should have an identity outside your home. So here you go. Good luck. <laughs> Hi, Diane. Hi. My name is Emily. And f thank you again for taking time to come here and to meet all of the lovely ladies and gentlemen here at Google. Um, I want to share with you um, a little bit about myself um, because I do want to ask you for your advice. Um, I grew up um, being very involved in art and design and I thought that that was something that I really wanted to get into. Um, when I graduated college, uh, we were just recovering from the economic recession. So at that point in time, my peers and I, we were just happy to get a job. We weren't, you know, thinking about our passion. We just wanted to make sure we weren't unemployed. Um, so I got into tech and I found my way here at Google. And when Google comes calling, um, you don't say, oh, well, I don't know. I don't want to be in tech. You just say, hey, where is the dotted line? Like, I'm going to sign. Um, but now um, I definitely want to ask for your advice and see if I still have a passion for art and fashion. Um, you know, what should I do? Should this be something I can pursue or... I, th I think that, first of all, you have to make sure that you have to have an idea that makes sense. And maybe you can combine your passion for art with, with tech. And, <clears throat> and you, that's, that's really how it goes. You have, to be, you have to do something that you like, clearly. And, um, but I don't know. I mean, you, maybe you're just a painter, and, and you like to paint, and you could also be a, a tech. I think that you have to listen to your heart, and, but also to your brain, and make sure that whatever you do makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. So I'm a little bit older than most of the crowd here. So I'm, when I'm listening to you talk about all the failures you've had in your life, and for me, especially since I'm kind of stuck in a start over phase through no doing of my own, how do you go about the start over after the failures? Do you have a ritual? Because, I mean, it's going to happen a lot. That's part of being alive. So what's your process for dealing with it after you figured out you failed and you need to go on to the next step? Don't dwell on the negative. Just don't dwell on the negative and learn from it, you know, and just, just be excited about starting again. I mean, just starting. There's nothing more fun than starting because... So much is unknown, and so much, and the unknown is exciting. It shouldn't be scary. I think it's exciting, and you just go for it. I mean, this is a company where, um, if you don't believe in miracle here, then I don't know. All right, thank you. Thank you. Well, one follow up question, Diane, related to that. In your book, you talk about you had this incredible success starting so early in your 20s. And then you, took, you did take a brief hiatus and then decided to relaunch and come back. So what was the thought process where you decided to start again? Well, I, I, had, I, I thought I was finished with fashion, and then I came back, and, and I realized my brand had disappeared. And, and to, with that also side of my identity, and I didn't like that. And You know, I mean, 
I had, I mean, I've had failures, but I mean, when I hear it like that, it's like overall my life has been pretty successful. So what I try to explain in the book that not everything goes right and, and you just make it, make it work. I mean, but there were a lot of moments that, I mean, nobody outside, I was interviewed um, recently in London by a journalist, a fashion journalist who has known me all along, all through these things. And he had no idea that I was going through a difficult time because you don't say it, right? And he read the book and he said, oh my God, I had no idea this and that and that. So what I try to do in the book is that it's like an x-ray of how I felt. And how I felt is how I felt. So outside, nobody knew that, you know. Anyway. We're glad you launched again. Last question. Um, hi, I'm Erin. Um, I just had a quick question. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on in fashion tech, particularly around democratizing luxury brands. I think you yourself are on websites like Rent the Runway. I don't know if that's by choice, but I'm just curious to see as a designer if you think that those sorts of mechanisms devalue your brand or you're happy that more no, people are wearing them. I or? met those girls. They, they, I, I think I was the first person that they came to see and, and uh, they were smart. I almost hired them. Uh, um, <laughs> But it's, it's, and again, I said about them, you know, they, they it, I don't know if anyone knows, but it's about renting clothes. And I, I think that they're great girls, and I, but I'm not sure that five years from now that what they're doing now is exactly what they will be doing then. At this point, they have the largest dry cleaning business, you know, in the country. <laughs> so it's, but, but, but. It was the, their way in, so we'll see where it all goes. No, I think we all welcome that. I think we all welcome that. I think it's, it's, it's all good. Thank you. Thank you. Even fighting fakes, you know, that's part of the, that's part of the journey. So before we wrap up, I like to close with something that I like to call free word association, where I say one word. And I'm going to ask you to say the first word that comes to mind. <laughs> Starting with fashion. Fashion. Um, fashion, I would say beauty. Beauty. Travel. Travel, I would say adventure. Belgium. Belgium, I would say boring. <laughs> Confidence. Confidence, I would say confidence is indispensable. Google. Google is Google Google is what it sounds like. <laughs> it Googles. Passion. Huh? Passion. Passion. Passion life. Role model. Role model, my mother. And finally, wrap dress. Wrap dress, paid my bills. <laughs> oh, that, that's a little piece of the TV show. Before we close, we want to give everyone a sneak preview of this Sunday's episode. Amanda, yeah. come on. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm literally freaking out, like shaking. My heart is beating. I think my vision is like going blurry. Bronson came to say, see me and he said, wow, you know, I'm a little nervous. How is it going? At times there's like a little bit of tension. What goes on? Well, I got in like a little argument with Brittany today. She's trying to say little things to put herself here and put the others below. And I don't think that's right. She likes to be the boss and like take charge of the situation. And I've kind of just let her, but I'm at the point where I like, feel like I'm getting emotional. I don't usually. No, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. You know, when I was young, I didn't want to be taken advantage of. As I get more confident and less insecure, I realize that you have to stand for who you are. Yeah. It's important, especially in the fashion industry, to actually forget about 
the personality of the people you're working with. Just get the job done. Sunday at 10 o'clock, and you could tweet a lot so my ratings go on. Before we close, I wanted to share with everyone, there are copies of Diane's two new books. One is the memoir, The Woman I Wanted to Be. I can't recommend it highly enough. I loved reading every word. And the second is this beautiful coffee table book called The Journey of a Dress. And Diane will be with us a bit longer and to I'm sign good. them. If you have the book on your laps, can you bring it up like that so I can take a nice picture? All right. Thank you. A very warm thank you.